Thank you for joining us this evening as Nova Scotians try to come to grips with a deadly shooting spree in the province. A province that is already on edge was shaken this afternoon after multiple reports of gunfire around Halifax. RCMP issued an all clear just a short time ago. Our Alexa McLean has been following this story today and joins us now from Upper Ten Talon with the latest. Alexa, what do we know so far about what happened? Well, thank you, Sarah. There is definitely a sense of relief in this area surrounding Tantalan communities, which were the center of a police investigation for several hours this afternoon. Now, shortly after 2 p.m., Nova Scotia RCMP confirmed they were responding to an unconfirmed report of shots fired in the Halliburton subdivision of Tantalan. Local businesses like Sobeys and the NSLC locked down as a safety precaution, and residents were asked to stay in inside. Several streets throughout the Halliburton Hills and Highland Park Heights subdivision were blocked off by RCMP. Around 4 p.m., an emergency alert was issued, stating police were on the scene of a wooded area between Halliburton Hills and Highland Park Heights subdivision. The alert stated police were also responding to an additional report of shots fired in the Omega Court area of Hubley. Now, Sarah, this sense of relief is very fresh because it was just about 30 minutes ago that the RCMP gave the all clear for the communities of Halliburton, Tantallon and Hubley. RCMP say there was no evidence of shots fired, so definitely a big sense of relief. Back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Alexa. That's Alexa McLean live for us tonight from Upper Ten Talon. Tensions are incredibly high in the province right now. It's been an extremely stressful day on top of an already dreadful week in our region. We're learning more about the mass killings in central Nova Scotia last weekend and the difficult task that faced police who were trying to apprehend the killer. You know, I, I've been a police officer for almost 30 years now and I can't imagine any more... Uh, horrific uh, set of circumstances uh, when you're trying to search for someone that looks like you. Uh, the dangers that that causes, the complications that that causes. Um, that will obviously was um, uh, an advantage that the suspect had on the police, that he had on the public, that he had on every person that he encountered. That was RCMP Superintendent Darren Campbell, who gave a detailed account of what happened during that shooting rampage, which left 22 people dead and three more injured. In a moment, we'll have more on the maps and the timelines released of the killer's movements. But first, Ashley Field joins us live with more on the gunman's actions on Saturday night. Ashley. Yes, Sarah, that's right. So I'm going to take you back to port a -Pic on Saturday night. That's where sources tell Global News that a party was underway. The shooter in this case, Gabriel Wartman, and his girlfriend were at that party. That's where some sort of argument broke out. They went home, and that's where things escalated into violence. Wartman assaulted her, tied her up, and then turned his attention back to the party, which is where this killing spree began. So this is Saturday, uh, 1030 at night. RCMP get reports of shots fired, they head out to the area. It's a rural area, no sidewalks, no street lights. RCMP say officers come upon mass destruction and chaos, multiple victims and structure fires. They call in backup, emergency response units, the canine unit and air support. Then they find a man with a gunshot wound. He tells officers he was shot by a man driving what appeared to be a police cruiser. They set up a perimeter and learn fairly early on who they are searching for. Gabriel Wartman, a nearby homeowner known to have uh, what police believe were three mock vehicles. His house is on fire and two of those lookalike cruisers on his property are also ablaze. Now they learn a third mock cop car is at his property in the HRM. And at this point, still Saturday night and early into Sunday, police say they believed the area was contained and that three things could have happened. Suspect was still in the area, the suspect had escaped, or the suspect was uh, in one of his burning residences and actually committed suicide. 
So fast forward to Sunday morning, 7 o'clock. A woman emerges from the woods. She has been assaulted. She tells officers that she is Wartman's girlfriend. She also tells them that he has a fourth police cruiser, mock police cruiser, that RCMP at this point did not know about. He also has multiple guns on him and a police uniform. This is also when they learn about that, what they're calling significant assault that happened prior to this uh, killing spree beginning. That could very well have been uh, the catalyst to start the chain of events. However, we're, uh, we're not going to, to discount any possibility of any pre-planning at this time. Now, RCMP say that she is a critical witness in this case. They have been speaking with her extensively, and she has been cooperating with RCMP as well while she is recovering from her injuries. I should also note that RCMP say that they did not find a hit list uh, so far in this case. Sarah? Okay, thank you, Ashley, and our thoughts are certainly with that woman. Ashley Field, live from our Halifax studio this evening. We also have new details about what happened after the shooter left port pic until he was killed in Enfield the next morning. RCMP are revealing how the gunman may have slipped past them in the night. Elizabeth McSheffrey reports. We now have a time-stamped map of how this massacre unfolded, starting in the small beach town of Portapic. A total of 13 victims were found there after 10.26 p.m. on April 18th, and police say they were looking for more than one suspect. They set up a perimeter about four square kilometers altogether. Take note of the 11-hour time gap between when the bodies were found in Portapic and when the next set of victims was found in Wentworth on Sunday morning. RCMP say they still don't know what the shooter did overnight other than slip through that small perimeter. And we've uncovered some information to suggest that there was a vehicle, and this was much after the fact, uh, that was seen leaving through a field, driving through a field. At this point, we are assuming, and I don't like to assume, but we're assuming that could very well have been the suspect that has, was leaving the area. Early April 19th, the gunman killed two men and one woman at a home on Hunter Road, setting it on fire before moving to another home on Highway 4. The shooter knew these folks and knocked on the door, but they didn't answer and were able to ID him to a dispatcher after he left. The gunman continued south to Wentworth where he shot a woman walking on the roadside. By 10.08 a.m. he was in DeBert where he shot two people in their cars. Shortly afterward, Constable Chad Morrison had arranged to meet Constable Heidi Stevenson at Highway 2 and 224. Constable Morrison thought that the vehicle was Constable Stevenson. The approaching police vehicle was actually driven by the gunman. The gunman pulled up beside Constable Morrison and immediately opened fire. Constable Stevenson, likely traveling north on Highway 2, then had a head-on collision with the shooter. She engaged him and he killed her. A passerby who stopped was also shot and their vehicle stolen. The gunman drove that silver SUV to a home on the east side of Highway 224. He killed the woman who lived there, changed out of his RCMP uniform, and made his way to the Irving Big Stop in Enfield. By chance, while the shooter was gassing up, a police officer swung by to refuel. This officer shot the gunman at 11.26 a.m. RCMP now know from videos they've collected that the shooter came into close proximity with other officers during his spree, but chose not to engage them. The RCMP hope to address these questions and more as their investigation into this deadly massacre continues. Elizabeth McSheffrey, Global News, Halifax. That news conference from RCMP this morning lasted just over an hour and, as you've heard, gave a significant amount of information about this ongoing investigation. Now, to talk more about this, we're joined now by Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson. Mercedes, that was a remarkable news conference by RCMP. Where does the investigation go from here? Well, Sarah, there are still so many sites that the RCMP are trying to pour over to get all of the forensic details that they can. They'll certainly be talking to anybody who knew the gunman, asking if he had talked about doing something like this, if they were aware of his planning or his motives, if they know anything about particular people he may have been targeting. And also one of the big questions that everyone is looking for those answers to, how many people knew that he had this kind of a police uniform or police car? Did anybody in the RCMP know about it? 
it? And what did they think he was doing with it if they were aware of it? How did he get those guns? Another big question. And they've said that one was registered in Canada, they believe, but he didn't have a firearms license. The rest came in from the U.S. So did he have some kind of a license in the U.S. and he was smuggling these guns back into Canada? Was he buying them illegally? How did he come into a possession of such a large number of firearms and what was he doing with all of those? One of the biggest challenges, though, in all of this is, first of all, the fact that a number of the witnesses tragically have died. Uh, the gunman himself, of course, is dead, so he can't answer questions. And he burned his home to the ground, at least the one uh, that was out in port au and with it, all of the evidence inside. But certainly police will be searching any computers remaining, social media, any phones that may have survived that could be in his denturous practice or in any of the other locations where he owned or co-owned property. Okay, Mercedes, were there questions that you thought were left unanswered in all of that? Obviously, there's an extensive investigation still to come here. Uh, I'm curious to know how well he was known to police before this. We know there was a previous minor incident with the Halifax Regional Police, but before that, he had a conviction for assault. Was there anything in police records between then and now that indicated uh, that this was someone who was violent? I'm very curious to know, Sarah, how he got those guns, uh, because that could expose as well a larger loophole for how guns are coming in or whether or not he had any kind of help. Um, and I think tragically, at the end of this, while we're looking for all of these answers, the why will probably never really make sense of such a horrific act. But there will also be difficult questions in coming days for the RCMP about how they responded, but important ones, because things like having enough training or equipment could potentially save lives in the future if that was lacking in this case and we simply don't have the information to know the answers to that just yet at this time. Okay, thank you so much, Mercedes. That was Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson live tonight from Ottawa. With heavy hearts, people continue to show their support for the victims and their families with roadside memorials that stretch right across this province. As Jesse Thomas reports tonight, many are finding new ways to grieve and come together during the pandemic. Darlene Morrison and her husband made the drive to port pic Friday morning from Dartmouth to pay their respects to the victims of the mass shooting. She hung 22 butterflies at this roadside memorial near port pic Beach Road. thought, you know, uh, the first responders and the RCMP, you know, they're, they're there to serve and protect for humanity. And I thought, you know, we can't hug each other now. And so this is this is a hug for humanity in a sense. People in port pic are still reeling from this senseless tragedy. Devastation is pretty much that. If I have to pick one word, that is that is it. Um, sh shock. It's 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 sad. With COVID-19, we're being forced to mourn differently. We can't come together like we normally would, so people are getting creative in their ways to show support. Vandenhoek built this memorial for people to hang items. Sunday, when everything was happening, we just kind of found myself not knowing what to do and needing to do something. 70 kilometers south in Shubenacadie, Lloyd and Arlene Hillier organized a remembrance visual along the highway to honor the 22 lives lost. We were playing a game of Scrabble the other night and while we were playing it we said we'd like to do something. <laughs> so we decided that this would be our way of reaching out. And a moment of silence was held. We are not carpenters, but we made some pretty rough hearts and painted them, and we thought we'd like to share them with other people. The group held their hearts along the highway overpass for the passing motorists to see. Brian Arts brought a cross for Gina Goulet, a dear friend of he and his wife. Goulet was killed at her home in Shubenacadie Sunday morning. You know, if anybody knew Gina and got the opportunity to hang out with her, you, you knew you were in, in for a good time, right? So Arts said he needed to be here. The truckers, everybody was honking, showing their support they know what happened here like you know we don't want to be put on the map for this reason but uh, but the love and support that we we seen here today is just incredible as we continue to practice social distancing measures Nova Scotians continue to find unique ways to pay tribute Jesse Thomas Global News Shubenacadie Nova Scotia